I joined up when I was uh, 18, just turned 18, and uh, my friend and I decided that uh, we were wasting our time in, in high school in fifth form. <laughs> and my father always said we joined the army to graduate. <laughs> and there might be truth in that too, because they did give us a year when we joined the army. Oh yes, we had five years in the, in the cadet corps. And, and in those days, everybody had to serve in the cadet corps unless you were uh, mentally incapacitated or physically un incapable of getting around. Uh, those were the rules by the principal of the high school, Mr. Archibald, and uh, he felt very strongly that everybody should serve in the cadet corps because his son was one of the first casualties in, the, in Oakville in the Air Force. When, we, uh, when I joined the cadet corps, well, we had to in first form high school, it was grade uh, nine, I guess it is now, but it used to be first form. There were forms one, two, three, four, and five, and when we joined the uh, cadet corps at the age of what, uh, what would it be twelve, thirteen, uh, we were issued uh, First World War uniforms, and of course the uh, gentleman who was the caretaker, Mr. Burford, who had been a sergeant major in the First World War, he he more or less ran the cadet corps and did some of the drilling, and he was in charge of all the supplies, which were big wooden boxes full of First World War uniforms and of course they were the old brass button uniforms with the uh, putties and, and the whole bit and we were issued uh, Ross rifles. Now I was I'm always short but I was particularly short in those days and the Ross rifles were taller than I was and we had to do the full manual of arms because the Ross rifles had 30 inch barrels on them, were huge things. Anyhow after a few years of that the uh, government decided they needed the Ross rifles to issue to the Air Force because there were short, shortage of uh, small arms. So then we were issued a Boer War uh, Martini Henry single shot rifles and they came in boxes that had been in boxes since before the First World War. And we had to clean all these things and get them so they looked presentable and they were even longer than the Ross rifles. So, so that's what we were issued with, uh, Boer War rifles and uh, First World War uniforms. As the war progressed, we, that changed a bit. We still had Boer War rifles, but they did bring in, I think, the odd Bren gun or Lewis gun, and we trained on them. When I joined the Army, my chum and I, Bill Russell, uh, Bill's still around, and Bill and I had been chums all our lives, still good friends, and we went down to Toronto, the two of us, one day on the bus, and, and joined the artillery, and they sent us to Petawawa. And we trained up in Petawawa for four or five months, and then when it came time in the fall of, early fall of 44 to go overseas, Bill was two months too young to go. So I went and uh, Bill, Bill came over after, but that's when we lost contact. But we'd been friends all those years for 13 years in high school and, and uh, even before public school, uh, 13 years in school and even before we went to school we played as kids. His father was the local undertaker and he lived just down the street from where we lived on Trafalgar Road, or Dundas Street in those days. Well, actually, I, I trained as a, as a field gunner, and I was a qualified gun layer. We were on 25-pounders, but before we went overseas, we never fired a 25-pounder. We had old 18-pounders from the First World War, 1917, and the ammunition was from 1917. About every fifth round wouldn't go off. But <laughs> and Bill tells me he stayed here in Canada, and uh, fired, they were firing all those rounds off, and he fired so many off, and now he has a hearing aid and he has a pension for it. <laughs> but we trained on 25-pounders, and then uh, I went to England. We stayed in England a very short time, and they shipped me over to, uh, to Europe. I uh, landed in France and Calais, and I went to Belgium, and then from Belgium I joined the regiment, and we spent the winter of 44, 45 at Nijmegen, at the Nijmegen Bridge. But I never used my training, although I got 10 cents a day more for it, for being a gun layer. I never used my qualifications. They, when I arrived at the regiment, they decided they needed a, so, uh, another soul in the reconnaissance unit. There was 10 of them, so that's where I went. So, yeah, Oh, we did all the Joe jobs. Actually, we were attached to headquarters, and when the regiment moved, we used to have to go out and go ahead of the regiment and pick the sites for the, the accommodation and what, wherever headquarters was going to be. And then, uh, of course, when we did that, we had very little to do, so they find all kinds of jobs for us to do. We used to do flash spotting. We'd go up with a range finder and spot the gun, enemy gun flashes and read the, the distance and send that back so they could do counter-battery work. 
and we used to run uh, wires out or uh, telephone wires out to the forward observation posts so they could be in contact by wire as well as radio for the counter battery work. <laughs> that, the, the, an interesting story on the, on the uh, running wire out, I think we were in Moyland, which was around the Hochwald Forest in Germany, and it was miserable in February and March. And uh, we were running, uh, told to run a wire out to the forward observation post, and uh, my chum and I, we drew the lot to wire it. We were running this wire out, and we came to the dugout where uh, George Blackburn, the, the author of the book, uh, the, Guns of, the Guns of Victory, uh, must be in the library. And uh, we ran the wire out for his telephone. And of course, it was dead when we got there. But in any event, we went inside the dugout. And as soon as they opened the flap and you saw the light, uh, a chap said to me, Harry Barrett, what the hell are you doing here? And it was Ralph Young, who was the second in command of uh, the uh, Royal Regiment from Toronto. And uh, it was a major. And Ralph knew me as a kid. He just lives across the street from, from Erklis. And of course, he's dead now. And his wife knew them well. He knew me and the family. And what a strange place to be. He says, what the hell are you doing here? And I said, the same as you, Ralph, trying to stay alive. <laughs> and Major Blackburn didn't think much of it. Well, Captain Blackburn, in those days, he didn't think much of me talking to the Major that way. <laughs> but it was, what a, what a coincidence it was. But that was another funny story. When we ran the wire up, it was oh, at night, and it was muddy and cold, and we were getting shelled, and uh, the wire was dead. So we had to trace the wire all back at night to find the break, and we found a couple. And we didn't find breaks, we found the wire was tied together, not spliced because we had to pick our own wire. And it turned out the chum of mine was quite a joker. We were supposed to splice the wire together, but he just tied a knot in it. So we had spent the rest of the night feeling this wire along on our hands and knees to find, and oh, I cursed him for that. <laughs> you know, you never see them after the war, but when you were there for such a short time with them, you lived, you slept together, well, uh, and the whole bit, you did everything together. We, the 10 of us, we drew our own rations. We didn't have a cookhouse or anything like that. We drew our own rations, did our own cooking. And we cut our own hair, everything. We did everything together. And, uh, at one time, we had a barber chair that we picked up someplace in the back of the truck. And we used to cut each other's hair and we had a parachute from, uh, or a piece of a parachute from a bridge too far at Nijmegen because we spent the winter there. And we used to use that for the, uh, like the barber puts that white thing around, we had one of these with a drawstring and we'd take turns in cutting each other's hair. And you had to be careful how you cut your chum's hair because you remembered he cut yours. <laughs> so so uh, I still have a piece of that parachute at home from, uh, from a bridge too far from Arnhem Bridge. Yeah, yes, mm -hmm. I have a, a big Nazi flag, a swastika flag, red, black, and white, which I got in, um, in Calcar, which was on the way to the Rhine River. We came across a uh, German uh, it was gasoline station. Actually, it was a shale gasoline station. I remember that now. And the, uh, was flying the German swastika flag, and the German battery, artillery battery, had used that as their battery headquarters. And of course, they got out in a hurry and left their flag behind. So when we came along, I took the flag, and I still have it. Well, I, I think it, uh, it did quite a bit. I know uh, I kind of surprised my mother uh, when I came home. Uh, um, I was, uh, what was it? I had my 20th birthday on the Ile de France coming home. And of course, uh, I was a little different than when I left. You were a much rougher character when you come home than uh, when you left, you know. I remember I always was fussy how what I ate, and I had a delicate stomach, and you know, after the war you'd eat anything that wasn't nailed down, because <laughs> we used to do all our own cooking. And uh, we lived off the land, basically, in, in, in Germany. Oh no, we chickens, farmers' chickens, eggs. Oh, we'd kill the odd cow or the I can remember this one place we got into, we hadn't had any meat and there were a lot of sheep around so we, we uh, killed a sheep and uh, the one chap who was with us had been a butcher in Sarnia and he was going to butcher the sheep. Well, the, uh, the United Nations, uh, they took a dim view of butchering, of course there were German cattle, but butchering uh, German livestock, so uh, somebody said, uh oh, so we had a... Uh, a wrecker, what we call a wrecking truck, like a big tow truck, and we just, uh, the sergeant said, break its leg. So we broke its leg and we had it hung up on the back of the tow truck. He was going to skin it and the inspector came in and he said, 
when we started to raise a bit of stink with the sergeant major about killing this sheep. And the sergeant said, look, we had to, we had a broken leg. <laughs> so we had fresh meat. Uh, young, uh, young soldiers like myself, young gunners like myself, uh, I was with a second div, and of course I was a reinforcement, and I hadn't been there that long, just about eight months. And the, uh, they were forming the Army of Occupation, they were bringing, we were the Army of Occupation, the second div was, and the, until they formed a new Army of Occupation, and then the, uh, they could go back to England and back home to Canada. But they took the young, young fellows like myself and a few of us, and they sent us to the Army of Occupation back to Holland. And uh, I, I know uh, when I got back there, they were checking all the documents because in those days, there were no documents. The war was over and the war was on. They didn't, there was no, they didn't worry about things like that. But of course, then you went back to the Army of Occupation, everything was going to be prim and proper the way it is in Canada, I suppose, with the Army of Occupation. So they asked me for my pay book. Well, I'd been warned, tell them you don't have one. So I said, I don't have a pay book. And what they were checking to see is when you had leave back to England, what they call a bloody leave. Well, I had just come back from a, a bloody leave before they sent me the Army of Occupation because the headquarters decided if they were going to do you, if they were going to send you to that den of iniquity, they were going to uh, give you some relief. So they sent me back to England. I had a couple weeks leave in England. They had relatives there. And my brother, who was a captain of the medical corps was there, and uh, I'd come back. So when they asked me for my pay book, of course, I said I didn't have one. It had been burned or lost or something. And that was the old trick, because the pay book listed all your equipment. And we said we didn't have any equipment, so they re-equipped us with all new equipment. It was, and we flogged the rest of it. But in any event, uh, they said, well, well, we'll have to give you a leave. So they sent me back to England, and I'd just been there for two weeks before. So I got back to leave and I met my brother who was four years in England, he was coming home. And uh, he, uh, his, my leave was up but he had a few more days to go so he said, oh I can fix that. So he knew people in headquarters in London, he said, I'll just have them send a telegram and I'll give you a note. So he did. And uh, I got to Dover to go across the channel, there was no channel in those days. And uh, the, the channel was so rough they wouldn't... Uh, they couldn't uh, go across the channel, so we stayed in Dover for a couple, two or three days. And we took the slow route back from uh, France to, uh, to Germany. I took the slow way back, naturally. And when I got there, it was about 10 days overdue. And of course, we had a, an English captain who had just come over from England. I always remember him. And he put me under close arrest for desertion. By this time, I was a bombardier. And he said, uh, you'll lose your stripes, you'd be a gunner and you're under close arrest. So it was fine. I tried to explain to him what happened and he wouldn't listen. So I said, fine. So a few days later he came in and apologized to me and said he was very sorry, but he'd had a, a telegram from headquarters in London and he confirmed that my brother had extended my leave and then he had a telegram from headquarters in London signed by a brigadier bearer. So his comment was to me, who the hell are you? And I said, I gave him my rank and number. I said, you know who I am, sir? And I told him. And he said, yeah, but who are you? And I told him. And he said, well, you never told me you had a brother. He said, you told me you had a brother that was a captain, but you never told me you had a brother that was a brigadier. And I said, who oh, didn't I? And to this day, we have no idea who Brigadier Barrett was or who, if there ever was a Brigadier Barrett, but it worked fine. I got a nice cushy position out of that. And very shortly, I was back in England on my way home. <laughs> Well, my brother takes great delight in telling him. My 80th <laughs> birthday, he was telling everybody about He said, don't let him believe you. He, was, he has a criminal record. He was placed under arrest. And he goes up and tells the story. <laughs> of course, he's 87, and he did retire as a colonel. Bill Archibald was a, the son of the principal of the Oakville High School. And he was one of the first to be killed in the Air Force in the, in the Second World War. Well, you know, Oakville had the highest percentage of enlistments in Canada. And uh, uh, there are a great many uh, Oakville people who were killed in the Air Force. Uh, a few, there's a, there's a uh, 
big uh, collage of pictures someplace about those that served in the Oakville High School that served in the war. It's amazing how many of them are, were in the Air Force and killed in the Air Force. This is a collage of all those that were killed. Yeah. Yeah, Oak, Oakville did have a very, very high, if you didn't join the Army or serve in, in Oakville, well, there was something wrong with you. <laughs> I think the, my whole class in high school pretty well, except one or two, uh, all served in something or another. The Army, the Air Force. You didn't really think about it. In 18, you, you know, you really, uh, I don't think you uh, are really that patriotic when you're 18. I suppose we are in a way, uh, but uh, uh, it was just a thing to do. If you didn't join up, it was, you know, it was expected of you. You were expected to join up, sir. And, you know, it, it was an adventure. It was an adventure, you know. Uh, you, uh, at 18, you're pretty well figured that to nothing, you're immortal, nothing's going to happen to you. Some of the crazy things that happen to you, you know, the near misses you get, you'd, you'd, you'd shudder in your boots today if you thought about it, but you didn't think anything of it. It just happened. Mm -hmm. Well, but, uh, well, everybody rises to the occasion. I think Canadians certainly did. I can, well, I can tell you one funny instance, you want a funny instance about how close you get. We were, I forget where we were. And, we were in, in Germany, I know, and we pulled into a position, and uh, the signals, uh, one of the, the chap, the signals driver and myself, we went for a walk to a little, little town by Marani, by the size of Brown. We walked down the street. We were looking for some clean bedding. We were always looking for dry and clean bedding because we were sleeping outside. And you were always wet and cold, and uh, we went up the street and looked around and couldn't find anything. And on the way back, uh, five Germans came out with a sergeant and their hands up. And uh, we took them prisoner, and in questioning them, I had the, I took the, the pistol from one of them, and uh, questioning them, they had a machine gun nest, and they had it trained on the two of us going up the street, and uh, they debated whether they'd shoot us, because they figured anybody that was walking up the street in broad daylight, strolling along like that, there must be a lot more around. So they just debated and they decided they'd give themselves up. So on the way back, they came out, we were in, dug into a hedgerow. They gave themselves up. And when we marched them back, uh, the sergeant said, where did you get those? I said, just up the street. <laughs> so that's how close it you, you didn't realize it. You didn't think about it. Today, you'd wonder, but oh yeah, we, had, we had a few occasions. I can tell you about, the, I have a funny little story about uh, the city of Cleve. Now, Cleve is where Anne of Cleves came from. And uh, it was a very old ancient city, but uh, when we uh, it was bombed pretty well out of existence. I remember when we were just outside Nijmegen, and they flew over at night to bomb it. And the bombers had all their landing lights on. There were so many of them, and they just flattened the city. We could see the we could read a newspaper 20 miles away, sitting up on the roof of the place we were at. The fires in Cleve. Well, when we went into Cleve, uh, it was right on the Rhine. They had to go up and smoke, what we call, we went up and smoke. They had these big smoke generators and we had to go through the smoke because the enemy could, could watch us, they could shell us, but if they couldn't see us, they wouldn't shell us. So we pulled into Cleve and we were tired and we uh, parked the vehicles around the back of this building and we went into the basement and went, went with all that was left and we went to sleep. And in, in the morning when we got up and came out, uh, British patrol came by and they asked us where we'd been. And they said, what do you mean where we'd been? And they said, well, were you there last night? And we said, yes. And they said, well, there was a German patrol came right by the street. And we caught them on the way back going over the river. <laughs> and they'd walked right by us. And we never, we never even knew that we were there. And they didn't know we were there, obviously. Another one when we were up sleeping in a haystack. And they had these outside haystacks, and in the morning we get up, and the other side there were two Germans sleeping in the haystacks. So <laughs> we had two more prisoners. <laughs> but anyway, you know, it was, uh, they were there doing the same as we were recently. But one thing, there was never any Nazis. There were no Nazis. You take the prisoners and come back, at, when we went into the rice wall forest, by the hundreds that came back, and they all had their hands up, and they were all saying, Nix Nazi, Nix Nazi because they, of course they were Nazis, but they were Nixon Nazis. And we said there are no, no Nazis in the German army. <laughs> well, yeah, it was, really a, let's say it was an interesting film. war. I wouldn't want to do it again, but I wouldn't have missed it. Mm. On the 11th of November, we always say every year we get braver.